Hi, and welcome to the Victory Church Podcast. We're so glad you could join us. If this ministry has impacted you in any way, we'd love to hear all about it. Please send us an email at share at victorychurchatl.org. We pray this message will speak to your heart. Before I get into the proclamation of God's word, I want to take a moment to just honor two very, very special and important women in my life. Uh, uh, First, uh, a woman of great faith, great character, great resolve, and great strength. A woman who the doctor told her she would never have children. And she defied that odds as she held on to God's word and held on to faith. A woman who taught me how to pray from her example, how to follow Jesus from her example. The woman through whom God would find so fit to send a prophet into the earth. I want to honor this morning my mother who's in the room, Miss Sharon Mitchell. honor uh, one of my day ones, um, one of the founding members of this church, a woman without her work, gifts, skills, effort, and faithfulness, we would not be here today. Uh, She gave her life to make sure this church got off the ground and to lead this church and now worship ministry for many years, doing graphics, built websites, prayed, served. Our very first uh, worship sets or practice wasn't even in a facility. It was out in a storage facility outside in the cold under the sky because we had no place to practice. She led through those difficult seasons before she would hand it off to Melissa. I want to honor one of my day ones and one of the founding and building members of this church. She put bricks on this wall. Would y'all help me honor Miss Mary doing her? <clears throat> in the house this morning. <clears throat> and uh, would you help me honor just one more person, our online family who watches from across the country and around the world? Thank you so much for watching. We love all of you who tune in from various cities all around the country. We get your DMs. We get your emails. I don't get a chance to shout every single one of you out, but we see you. We thank you for tuning in to this podcast, this YouTube broadcast, wherever you are in the city, wherever you are in this country, even in places across the world. I'm sorry to my sister Melissa, who is in... uh, another part of the world. I think I botched your city uh, last week, um, and so I apologize for that. You are in Christchurch, New Zealand, not Australia. So bless you, Melissa, in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, Shout out to you. Thank you for watching on the other side of the world. We pray that the messages that are leaving this pulpit, whether for myself or the other communicators here, are a blessing to you on the other side of the world. We want to welcome all of you in this room who are guests. Welcome to our 930 gathering. Welcome to Victory Church. We're going to welcome all of you to week six of a teaching series through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Okay. If you miss any of the first five messages in the series, they are available for you online. In this series, we have seen the blessing of being faithful wherever God plants you, whatever your job, whatever your vocation. We've seen the impact of being faithful wherever God plants you. I know some of you despise where you are, but God may have just set you up where you are for something much greater. We've seen the impact of following godly burdens, those things that God places in our hearts that lead us into destiny and new seasons. We've seen the impact of prayer and the impact of favor. Our favor would put us in places we never thought we would be. Our favor puts us in doors we would never thought we would be. We've seen the impact of unity and 
fighting for a common cause that's much bigger than ourselves. We've seen the impact of resilience against opposition. We've seen the good and bad of conflict. In this message, I'm going to walk you through Nehemiah chapter 6. Unfortunately, with a focus on a subject matter that has claimed the witness of many believers, it's claimed the testimony of many sons and daughters of God, it has shipwrecked people's faith, it has destroyed marriages, it has toppled churches, ministries, and has put people on the sideline watching the game of the kingdom from outside. It's at the center of Nehemiah chapter 6, and for as much as we like to avoid this conversation, we're going to talk about it because of the damage it does amongst the people of God. So we want to tag the subject matter from Nehemiah chapter 6 with just this simple exhortation to you and to me. We're just going to tag it, resist the schemes of Satan. For it has taken the best that God has from his people over and over and over and over and over again. And there are bloody believers on the sideline because of this that has wounded the lives of Christians over and over and over and over. And they are people who have walked away from the faith because of this over and over and over and over. And there are some people that will not finish their race because of this again and again and again. But not us in this room. And so our message title this morning is a declaration to you. It is my suggestion to you. It is my plea to all of us this morning, even in the booth. Resist. See, that's a military term. Resist. The opposite of that is yield. You don't like that word, right? No, we love that word, yield. No, resist is a military term. It takes fortitude and strength. Resist. The schemes of Satan. Eternal God and ever wise Father, Lord, we humble ourselves right now in your presence. And pray, Spirit of the living God, you would walk these aisles in rows. Pray you would open up our hearts right now to receive the seed of the eternal word of God. I pray you would awaken us and make us woke. And that you would teach us and that we would grow from the teaching of your word thereby. In the mighty name of Yahshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Resist the schemes of Satan. I want to I start this message this week by drawing your attention to this place right here. It was around this week, last year, I stood on a mountaintop just outside of the city of Jerusalem, and I snapped this pic of the Judean wilderness just outside of the city of Jerusalem. There was no green trees except a few. There was very little water except a gushing stream. There was very little anything at all out there in this barren Judean wilderness just outside of the city of Jerusalem. Listen to me. It was in this place just outside of Jerusalem when my wife and I stood on a mountain overlooking this barren wilderness. The man you and I call Lord, it was in this place a great battle was fought in this place. Not a battle of armies and horses and men and cavalry. 
Not a battle for territory and land, but a battle for another type of territory was fought in that wilderness, the territory of a heart, the territory of obedience, the territory of willpower, the territory of destiny. It was in this Judean wilderness the Lord Jesus Christ was met by Satan himself and what was a cataclysmic battle that happened between them two alone and no one else. It was a battle between him and the adversary Satan, the devil, that serpent of old, that serpent who according to Ezekiel was in the garden before Adam and Eve was created. It was there a great battle ensued, a battle for Jesus' allegiance to the devil. Three times Satan, that vicious spirit, would tempt the Lord Jesus Christ, once for food, once for glory, once for obedience. And what Satan was really after was not all the things that he could get from Jesus. What he was really after was his will, his witness, his testimony, his credibility. Had Jesus lost that battle in the wilderness, it is very plausible we would not be sitting here today sanctified, justified, and in our saved mind. Had Jesus not resisted the schemes of the devil in that wilderness, we would not have a testimony today. And notice when the devil came. When he had fasted 40 days, when he was, watch this word, vulnerable, when he was weak and tired, but also, watch this, after his baptism and before his public ministry. Ooh, you missed that. Watch. Satan came after he was affirmed by his father. Ooh. But before his public ministry. So he, was a, he came from after Jesus knew he was loved, but before he started his public ministry. He came for him after he got his greatest affirmation. You're going to get this. But before his public ministry. Oh, my God. <laughs> he came for him after his greatest affirmation, but before his public ministry. Oh, it's going to register in a second. He came for him after his greatest affirmation but before his public ministry. So he came after he knew he was loved by the cross for us, but before he can set out to do what God called him to do. So he came for him after I knew I was loved by the cross, but before I could finish the work that God called me to do. This is when he came for the Lord Jesus Christ with three schemes, three temptations, to snatch the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah, a man who worked a government job, heard about the brokenness in Jerusalem, was not born or raised there, returned back to Jerusalem with a burden in his heart to do something to help the people, rallies them around a common vision to rebuild the safety of Jerusalem, the massive walls that had been broken down 150 years prior. Begins the building project, sets out to do God's work, is met by military opposition on the outside of those walls, rallies the people for warfare and service, then is met by opposition on the inside of that walls, discord between the camp, saves the people from enemies, outside, saves the people from themselves, and now we come to a more nefarious and sinister type of evil in Nehemiah chapter 6, the first scheme of the adversary, the scheme of distraction through enticement, the scheme of distraction via enticement, Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 1, when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, three political leaders, and the rest of our enemies that had, they had heard or they had, or the rest of our enemies that had rebuilt the walls and not the gap was left in it. That's what they heard. Though up to that time, 
the doors was not set or the gates was not set. So they had walls with no gates. They had walls with no gates because gates are still necessary for access. Consequently, around the city of our heart, we don't want to build walls. We want to build gates. That's another message. Verse 2, Sambalot and Geshem sent me this message. Come. You better be careful about your comes. Not every come is a godly come. Not every come is a Holy Spirit come. You got to know who is behind the come. You got to know what spirit is behind every come. Behind every come is either the spirit of God or the spirit of our adversary. And we got to know what's behind every come. Come, they said. Let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Oh No. Oh No. But they will watch scheming to harm me, said Nehemiah. So I sent messages back to them with this reply. I'm going to come back to this at the end. I am carrying on a great project. In another translation it says, I am doing a great work. Watch his response. And watch, I cannot go down to you. I don't have time to come down to you because I'm carrying on a great project. I don't have time to come down to you because I'm involved in a great work. I don't have time to be distracted by that or by you because I'm involved in a greater work. I see you on my Instagram. I see you on my Facebook. I see you trying to entice me, but I don't have time to come down because I'm carrying on a great work. I hear them voices, but I don't have time to look left or right because I'm carrying on a great work. So he says, watch, I cannot come down. Why should I stop the work and leave it and come down to you? Yeah, but Satan is persistent. Four times they sent me the same message, and here is wisdom. And each time I gave them the same answer. Three times the devil tempted Jesus, and three times he gave him the same answer. It is written, it is written, it is written, saith the Lord. Four times they sent me the same come. Four times I sent them back the same answer. What's happening in this text? Three political leaders, this is so powerful. Listen, they realized our military might could not stop Nehemiah. The drama on the inside of the camp could not stop Nehemiah. Their ridicule could not stop Nehemiah. Now the walls is built, and the only thing left to do is put the gates on those walls. If they get those gates up, then we have no longer access to get to them. So watch, we need to stop them now before they build these gates. We need to stop them before they complete what God had called them to do. Ooh. We need to slow them down before they finish the work that God has given them. Ooh. We need to pick them off before they score. So these three men, right? Sambalot, Tobiah, and Geshem. Three political leaders in different areas around Jerusalem, they send a message to this man, Nehemiah. They say, listen, man, we want you to come meet us in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Now, Ono was an area just northwest of Jerusalem, about 20 miles outside of the city. Oftentimes, governors on their way to Ono would be assassinated on their journey. So now, these three political leaders, they sent a message to Nehemiah. They said, watch, come. Or in other words, leave the city of Jerusalem, watch this, and meet us in the plains of Ono. Leave the place where God planted you and meet us in this other place. Leave the will of God, oh, this is going to help somebody, and meet us in this other place. Isn't that how the devil works? Leave the will of God and meet me in this other place. Leave Jerusalem, leave the work behind, leave the people behind, and meet us on the plain of Ono. And watch what they said. They said, come, let's talk together, Nehemiah. Watch. This is a pretense of friendship under the guise of a scheme. So powerful is this text. I want to pull some principles out of this text. First of all, notice the people sending the message to Nehemiah. Three major political leaders. Man, in his mind, this could have been an attempt for him to say, well, man, this is my opportunity to sit down with people who are important. 
Here is my opportunity to sit down with people who are important. Wow, they got a lot of followers. Wow, they blowing up on Instagram. Wow, they meeting with this person and that person. Now they send me a message. Here is my opportunity to get into the camp I've been idolizing. What if Nehemiah wasn't emotionally mature? Or what if he wasn't emotionally healthy? What if he wasn't secure in himself? What if Nehemiah was so insecure, he thought that, man, if I could just meet with these people, they might accept me. And it shows us the danger of how when we are not secure in who we are in Christ, or when we are emotionally unhealthy, how easy it is for us to get sidetracked by the devil's come. So these three big bosses said, man, come, let's sit down at the table. And Nehemiah is so secure in who he is and so secure in the will of God. He said to them four times, I ain't got time to be fooling with y'all. I ain't got time to be fooling with you. I'm doing a great work. And while you're trying to entice me to come out of this city, while you're trying to entice me to leave the will of God, man, I will not come down because I'm doing a great work for the Lord. Man, what type of people avoid this level of temptation, because we have all fallen for temptation. We have all been enticed. Every believer in this room know what it is to feel a cum in your heart that did not come from Jesus. You know you're supposed to be at the job, but you feel a cum. You know you're supposed to be in that marriage, but you feel a cum. You know you're supposed to be in victory, but you feel a cum. Ooh, threw that in, right? You know you're where you're supposed to be, but you feel a cum. And how many of us have lost because of those comes? How many of us have been broken because of those comes? How many of us have been damaged because of those comes? How many of us have suffered because of those comes? But what type of people insulate themselves against those comes? Men like Nehemiah. That if we have a focused heart with clear priorities, a focused heart with clear priorities is best fortified against enticement. Enticement comes to everyone, but when our heart is focused on God's will, focus on what God said, focus on what God planted them, focus on what is head, and when a person has, watch, clear priorities, they are most fortified against enticement. There is no guaranteed protection against enticement, but when we are focused and when we have clear priorities, we are most fortified against enticement. Jesus was focused, and Jesus had clear priorities. You know what his priorities was? I must finish the work of the person who sent me. So because his priorities was clear, he would stand the devil in the wilderness. And because Nehemiah's priorities was clear, I must finish the building of this wall, he was able to withstand this first scheme of distraction via enticement. Let me ask you a question. Are your priorities clear? Do you know your order of service is God first, spouse second, children third, ministry fourth, job fourth? Are your priorities clear? Are you sold out for the will of God? Are you convinced about what he has for you? Are your priorities clear? Because when our priorities are out of order, it's easy for us to be watched, enticed or let out of God's will. Children don't come before spouse. Spouse don't come before God. Ministry don't come before God. God doesn't come after all of that. Oh, y'all missed that. God, spouse, children, work and ministry. God's will, everything else second. God, this boy second. God, this girl second. God, this job second. God, this child second. When our priorities is clear, we are better fortified against enticement. And side note, when our priorities is clear, all of our decisions are already pre-made. When you have clear priorities and strong convictions, all of your decisions is already pre-made. So the enticement or the law to do that is an easy no for me because my priorities is clear. And oftentimes we find ourselves in trouble when our priorities are not clear, when we are not focused, and when we don't have convictions. 
I want to say this again. When you have strong convictions and clear priorities, all of your decisions are already pre-made. You already know all your no's by your conviction. And you already all know all your no's by your priority. So I will not put Malachi, Israel, Abigail, and Josiah before Lena because my priorities are clear. So they can't get us against each other. Yeah, and I'm telling you this with them sitting right there, right? Lena comes first, then them, right? So I don't put them, then Lena. So because my priorities are clear, there's some things they will ask me and the answer is automatically no. Because my priorities are clear. So when priorities are clear, no's are clear. You're not going to offer me money to go past another church when God told me to pass the victory unless they say something different. So those offers are automatically no because my priorities are clear and I'm focused. Oh, but we got a church of 5,000. We'll pay you 250,000. I'd rather grind with my 700 with the salary I got right now because I am focused and my priorities are clear. I'd rather be in the grind with my people in a school than in your bougie building with a $250,000 salary. So no to that invitation because I'm grinding with the people of victory because this is where God put me. Focused with clear priorities fortifies the heart against distraction through enticement. The second scheme in the text, the scheme of defamation through intimidation. Verse 5. Then the fifth time, Sambalot sent his aide so I can't get to him. Let me send my friend. Because we partner with people in schemes. The devil knows how to partner with people in schemes. Um, when he was scheming against Jesus to stop him from going to the cross, he partnered with Peter. Oh, they missed that. When the devil was trying to stop Jesus from going to the cross, he partnered with Peter, Jesus' closest friend besides John. That after Jesus explained to them, I must go to the cross, here comes Peter. The scripture says he grabs him by his shoulders, takes him into a corner, and rebukes the Lord. You cannot go to the cross. Now I understand his desire, watch, his desire was to keep the Lord with him. Now this is powerful. Satan seized on a brokenness in Peter to try to deceive Jesus. Why? Because the devil will often work on the things that's inside of us. Our own brokenness and our own lusts to draw us into rebellion against God. He can only entice me with areas of weakness on the inside of me. Why would he tell Jesus turn stone into bread? Because he was hungry. Why would he tell Jesus throw yourself off this cliff? Because he had power to save himself. Why would he tell Jesus kneel down? Because he himself was a king. See? Satan can't tell me with weed. Because I'm already past that. He's going to try to entice you with brokenness that's already on the inside of you. So, man, when we're unhealthy and when we're broken, oh, there's an opportunity for power. There's an opportunity for glory. There's an opportunity for money. There's an opportunity for filling the blank. That's that brokenness in me. But when we are most satisfied, ooh, in Jesus and my security comes from him, Man, I fortify my heart against these type of enticements. That when I don't need anything to affirm me outside of my father. So Peter, longing to keep Jesus with him. The Satan seizes on Peter's own brokenness. And says, you can't go to the cross. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me. Satan. You have in mind the things of men and not the things of God. That Satan will watch, will even partner with people close to launch your schemes. So the fifth time, Sam Balot sends a friend, an aide with me with this message. Everybody watch. This is the scheme of defamation. You know what defamation is? The destruction of character. You know what that is? Let me get your witness. Because one of the most powerful things you have is your witness. And if the devil can take that from you, he neutralizes your credibility. That's why you need to guard your witness. 
That's why you got to be careful about the decisions that you make, the things that you say, and the things that you post, because the devil will scheme for your witness to diminish our credibility, to dim the light of your testimony. It got to be more than your profile, more than your God first, Proverbs P31. So he sent in this message in an unsealed letter. He says, quote, it is reported, Nehemiah, among the nations and Geshem, a gossip, says it's true, a gossip, says it's true, a gossip, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, he said in the letter, according to these reports, You are about to become their king and have even appointed a prophet to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report is going to get back to the king that you left. Remember that king that sent you here? Nehemiah, the king of Persia, Artaxerxes, is going to get back to him. So because of that, come. Let us confer together. Sounds like a friend. So I said, Nehemiah, they're saying this about you. It's reported among the nations. Who is among the nations? That's the tagline for they. You know what they're saying? saying? Who's they? Your one little gossip friend? Well, you you know what they're saying. Who's they? Your one little gossip friend is they. Among the nations. No, no, no. Only among Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem. That's why you can't panic over a they. They will have your heart panicked over a they. Well, you, they come to your job. Well, you know what they saying, girl? They saying you about to lose this job. You know what they said? Who's they? Who's they? He said, watch. He sent this in an open letter. And verse 8, he says, and I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is even happening. You are just making this up in your head. Now, some biblical history. So you can understand what's happening in text. In those days, in the ancient Near East and in biblical times, politicians, kings, and men who are nobility will send letters to each other through runners. This is powerful. And they always take wax, melt it in heat, and seal the envelope with the king's seal. Watch. So no one can read it. And so that it is official. He said he sent Nehemiah this letter in an unopened envelope. First, an insult. You're not even worthy of my seal. But secondly, so that the person who was carrying the letter can read it and everybody else along the way can read it. This was an attempt in ancient Near East culture when they sent unsealed letters, it was to promote gossip. So that as the letter traveled from city to city, people would open it and read it and then that news would spread. And the hopes of Sambalot was that as this letter got to Nehemiah, it would begin to spread around the countryside until it got back to the king that had sent him. Watch. Until it got back to the man who showed him favor. So what he was trying to do was ruin his, watch, relational equity with the person who gave him favor to be there in the same place, in the first place. So he was trying to defame Nehemiah, he was trying to ruin his witness. He was trying to ruin his credibility because your words only have as much power as your credibility. You don't even understand that the power of your words is connected to your witness. So when your witness is blown, your words lose power. When your witness is blown, your testimony lose power. And the devil will do everything he can to dull the brightness of your witness by leading you into schemes of defamation, trying to intimidate you and ruin your witness, ruin your credibility. If I could only get them to do that, now I can spread that gossip amongst the nations. Verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands were, oh, this is powerful. Everybody watch the text. Thinking, man, if 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 I could get them to be afraid of what people are saying, their hands will get too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. But Nehemiah prayed. So he spoke and he prayed, and he said, Lord, now strengthen my hands. 
Oh my God, now this is so powerful. He spoke, he said, man, nothing you're saying is true. Then he prayed, Lord, strengthen my hands. This is powerful. He spoke and said, nothing you're saying is true. Then he prayed and said, strengthen my hands. So against the false attack of Sambalot, man, and against this false narrative, against the intimidation of fear, against the intimidation of gossip, all of that, how did Nehemiah respond? With vocal truth and with prayer. Why? Because sometimes duty must be greater than deliverance or silence. Silence. And pastor, I don't understand what you wrote. Sometimes duty must be greater than deliverance and silence. Deliverance is played out. We over fantasize deliverance. That is, every time I find myself in a circumstance, I need God to get me out. Nehemiah didn't pray to get out of that circumstance. Why? Because he could not control what the people were saying. Oh my God. So gossip is flying from the open letter, but he cannot control what the people are saying. He can only control one person in the circumstance. He can only control one heart in the circumstance. He can only control one response in the circumstance, and that is himself. And so there's times when we are being intimidated, right? And we got to know when to remain silent and when to check a hater. Jesus knew when to remain silent and when to check a hater. He knew when to remain silent and when to speak. And sometimes I'm telling you our duty to speak and our duty to pray must be greater than deliverance or silence. That is, when I say greater than deliverance, that is God, I'm not praying to get me out of this, but I'm praying you will strengthen me while I'm on the inside of this. Because I know I need to be here, and so my duty is to pray for strength that I would remain in this. I'm not praying for an out. I'm praying for strength while I'm in. And I'm not staying quiet because sometimes you got to know to check a hater. Sometimes you got to know when to speak out against evil. I learned that from my mama. My mama knew when to be quiet. And my mother knew when to speak out against evil because sometimes duty must be greater than deliverance and silence. It's not always about God getting me out. Sometimes it's about God strengthening me in because I know I got work to do. Watch here. And it's not always about being quiet. Sometimes you got to know when to speak because every now and then you got to know how to check a hater. And every now and then you got to know how to speak out for God. And every now and then you got to know how to type for God. And every now and then you got to know how to post for God. If all believers stay quiet, who's going to defend him? See, don't nobody want to say amen to that. We're so soft and we're so wishy-washy. We just want to be like this and stay quiet. That ain't the Bible that I read. And that's not the believer God called us to be. Y'all looking at me like y'all never read your Bible. I thought the scripture says that the righteous are as bold as a lion who knows when to stay quiet and sneak and when to open their mouth and roar. Let me hear all the lions in this room roar. Y'all a bunch of pussycats. Let me hear all the lions in this room roar. A bunch of soft, wishy-washy pussycats. Oh, was he talking to me to Raw? Yes! I'm talking to you! Your Raw should have been a shout of triumph and victory and hallelujah! Let me hear all the lions in this room! Raw! The righteous are as bold as lions. who are tough and tender, soft palms, strong claws. So we saw the scheme of distraction through enticement. We saw the scheme of defamation through gossip. The last scheme in the text, the scheme of deception, verse 10. So he survives both of those schemes. Now this one is so profound and so powerful. Watch the text carefully. 
But this one right here is doing so much damage in the hour that we live in right now. One day, I went to the house of Shimeiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahedabel, who was shut in at his home. Oh, my gosh. And he said to me, let us meet in the house of God. Let us meet in the church inside the temple. And let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you by night and they are coming to kill you. Who is Shemaiah? Shemaiah was a prophet. He was a quote-unquote man of God. He was a quote-unquote religious leader amongst the people on the inside of the city. And he says to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, you know, these men are coming to get you. Why don't you meet me inside the temple so you can hide from them as they're coming to get you? Watch Nehemiah's response. He says in verse 11, but I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. Oh, come to my conference, buy my book, follow my podcast, I will not. Because in the city of your heart, you got gates too. Your eyes and your ears, they give access. Nehemiah said, I will not go to your conference. I will not buy your book. I will not go to your gathering. I will not listen to your service. I will not, he said. And watch the next two words. So powerful. He says, watch. I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit sin by doing this. And then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Oh, my God. He said, I realized. So this man, Shemaiah, this prophet, he sold out to the enemy and tried to use his influence to lure Nehemiah into the house of God to tempt him to come outside the will of God. Sadly, because of this momentary zeal, he is branded forever as a betrayer in the word of God. Sambalot attempted to work through a shady prophet and a shady prophetess to lure Nehemiah into the house of God. Why? Because we got to be careful, it teaches us, watch. We got to be careful about the voices that we listen to not everyone comes in the name of God is from God. And not everything that appears to be of God is of God. We must be careful where we give our ears to. Whoever has your ears would have your heart. Whoever has your heart has your life. One of the problems in this culture, we listen to too many people. Too many podcasts. Too many different preachers. And the last time I Bible checked, John wrote that there are many false prophets who have gone out into the world. They have gone out from among us. If you took every preacher in America and put us in one arena, in that room are real men and women of God and false men and women of God. There are people who were sent by the Holy Spirit and people who are filled of the devil. How did Nehemiah avoid that trap? The word realized. That's the tag word for this big word called discernment. Discernment dispels deception and it gives divine direction to dark decisions. When we have discernment, it dispels deception. It unmasks deception and it gives us divine direction when we have to make dark decisions. What do you mean by that, preacher? When I say dark decisions, that means it is not clear if this is good or bad. Some decisions, it's obvious this is a bad idea. Other decisions, it's so hazy, it's so cloudy. I need discernment. 
And discernment is not suspicious. Well, I think they're phony. No, 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 that's of the flesh. Discernment is a byproduct of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is a divine knowing in a moment. I hear what they're saying, but that don't sound right. I get around this person, but they don't feel right. I see that opportunity, but that don't seem right. I know what they're offering me, but that don't seem like, that don't seem right. It is a divine knowing on the inside that something about this person, this opportunity, this conversation, this contract is not right. That it takes divine discernment. It is ability for us to read, to read people, to read moments, to read information, to read situations. It's our ability to read people, read moments, read opportunities, read situations. It is a divine knowing of God. Something about this is not right. It's like static in your soul. How do you grow in discernment? A lot of people think, I just, no, we grow in discernment as we grow in prayer. And sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and our knowledge of God's word, we grow in discernment. It is our knowledge of God's word primarily that helps us to grow in discernment. Pastor, prove that to me. How did Nehemiah realize that this man was a phony? Watch the text. Verse 11. And I said, oh my God. Should a man like me run away? Pause. What is that? A self-evaluation of a moment. If I do this, is this in my best interest to do this? Those kind of questions lead us to discernment. Should a man like me run away? Why would his answer be no? We got all these people he's leading. If he runs away, he shows them that I don't have trust in God. And if he runs away, he comes off like a coward. So first he asks himself, is it in my best interest to do this? How many of us would be saved from bad things if we would just pause and ask ourselves, is it in my best interest to do this? That leads to discernment. Is this a godly decision? Is this a godly relationship? Is this a godly thing for me to do? That leads to discernment. But look at the second thing he says. Or should a one like me go into the temple and save his life? Nehemiah knew the Old Testament, and he knew that it was forbidden for people to go in the temple and hide except for the priests. It was his knowledge of God's word. That helped him to discern in a moment, this is a catastrophic decision for me. The more word we know, the more truth we know, and the more truth we know, the easier it is to discern a lie. Because the best lie is not an outright lie. That's that's bad. The best lie is a little bit of lie and a little bit of the scripture, and we mingle that into some doctrine. And so you spend all that time on Google reading about, oh, Jesus was a white man, and white man's religion, and oh, the the five percenters said this to me, and should you worship on the Sabbath, or on Sabbath, and you're reading all that stuff on Google, but you know more articles from Google than the Word of God. And so when they approach you at the water cooler, you're not ready. Or when you read that article on Google, you're not ready. We should, we would do ourselves a favor to spend more time in God's Word than more time on Google. He had discernment because he knew the word of God. That is, if I'm about to make a decision or somebody's telling me something that's outside the boundaries of God's word, I already could discern that this is not of God. We finish the text. Verse 14. So Nehemiah said, remember Tobiah and Sambalot. Oh my God. Because of what they have done, Remember also the prophetess Noadiah, that false prophet, and the rest of those prophets who have been trying to intimidate us. And then right here in verse 6, we find the reward of faithfulness. Verse 15 through 16. So the wall was completed in the 25th of Elo in 52 days. And all our enemies heard about this, and all the surrounding nations were afraid, lost their confidence, because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Because I'm an archaeological junkie, I will tell you, when they dug up the areas around Jerusalem, they found the walls of Nehemiah. That wall was... 40 feet high, 9 feet wide, and he marshaled a group of ordinary people to do an extraordinary task, and they accomplished that in 52 days. 
you finish the rest of the text, all we see is that Nehemiah will continue to be governor. And these very people, Sambalot, they married into, into the family with Jewish women. And so they always kept people on the inside stirring up trouble inside the city. Shows you that no matter how well you lead, you're always going to have people that don't trust you, don't believe in you. You're always going to have rebel rousers in the camp. And Nehemiah continued to lead with those rebel rousers in the camp. Because we're never really free from the enemy's presence. We just got to know how to resist the schemes of Satan, no matter what season we're in or what situation we find ourselves in. Not only was Jesus tempted in the wilderness, but how shall I close this message? He was also tempted on the cross as he hung there for you and me. Men full of the devil walked by and said, look, aren't you the son of God? Why don't you come down from that cross and save yourself? Watch. Why don't you come down and save yourself? And Jesus spoke, Lord, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. In other words, I will not come down because I am doing a great work of saving the world from their sin. So I cannot come down. And I want to prophesy to somebody in this room, you are doing a great work, being a great father. A great wife, a great friend, a great brother, a great worship leader, a great elder, a great servant of God. And we have to know that we are involved in a great work of building the thing that Jesus left behind when he died. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy of my service, worthy of my giving, worthy of my time. It's worthy of me building. And when the schemes of Satan comes against me, I respond to him by saying, I am involved in a great work. I am building a great marriage. I am being a great father, a great mother, a great husband, a great wife, a great servant at Victory Church, a great giver. I will not come down. I wonder what would happen in our homes? What would happen in this nation? What would happen in the Christian church if more believers got a revelation that they are involved in a great work? And said to themselves, every time the devil came to entice me, distract me, defame me. Intimidate me. I said, you know what? I am doing, Alea, a great work. Demetria, Maya. We are doing a great work. So, man, what I hear or what the devil try to entice me with or do around me, I will not come down because I'm doing a good work. My witness, no, you can't have that, devil. I will not come down to that level because I am doing a great work. And the next time he comes for you, I just want you to open your mouth and say to him, right in your prayer time, right in your car, right in your shower, say, you know what? I don't even know why I'm thinking about doing that craziness. I will not come down because I am doing a great work. Stay on the wall, build the wall, don't come down because you are involved in a great work. Father, in the name of Jesus.
thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word and the testimony of the scriptures. I pray, God, that this seed of your word will go deep into the hearts of your sons and daughters. That it would fortify us and anchor us in truth and protect us from the schemes of the adversary. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, you would give us focus and clarity of priorities. That we will be fortified against the schemes of the adversary. And Father God, I pray in this room right now, you would strengthen our hands for the work you have given us in our homes and in this church. And that we would declare boldly, Father, through our actions and our words, that we will not come down because we are doing a great work. I pray for every wall builder in this room that there will be greater buy-in in this season that we are camping. And I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, according to your prophetic word, for those of us who are born in, we will cross over with might and great power into favor and everything, God, you have in store for Victory Church. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this season. And I thank you for what we're about to lay hold to. We believe your mighty hand is upon us right now in this hour. And Father, we rebuke the devil, Satan, the Lord rebuke you and every scheme in this church. We are doing a great work. And Father, help us not to come down. That is my prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. And together we said, amen and amen. We truly hope this message resonated with you and encouraged you in Christ. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please support the spread of the gospel by visiting us online and choosing the giving option that works best for you. And again, thanks for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next week.